so yeah, we're going to be talking a little bit about S bombs today. And um, disclosure: no actual dragons were harmed in the creation of this presentation. Um, this one's going to be a fun one, I think. But uh, a little bit about me um, before we get started. I'm the leader of uh, two flagship OWASP projects. Um, first one is the OWASP Dependency Track Project. That's a uh, project that is uh, specifically designed to analyze, uh, consume, analyze um, SBOMs, software bill of materials. Um, I'm also the uh, chair of the Cyclone DX Software Bill of Material Core Working Group. And I'm the leader and the co-author of the OWASP Software Component Verification Standard. It's a it's a way for organizations to measure and improve their software supply chain assurance. Um, I participate in a lot of various working groups, uh, especially for the US government on software component transparency. And what I actually get paid to do is software security architecture, where I lead a team of, of architects, we, where we work with around 4,000 developers, helping the organization create and, uh, and maintain secure and resilient software. So, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about SBOMs today. And there's a, I don't know, um, most people have an analogy around SBOMs that um, it's a list of ingredients, right? At, at its very fundamental level, this is kind of what it is. Um, and as a consumer, this just happens to be a, a list of ingredients of uh, back of an energy bar. And as a consumer, this allows me to make very basic risk-based decisions. Uh, for example, if, if I'm allergic to nuts, uh, this is something that I might care about. Um, of course, in the software world, um, we're not necessarily um, looking for nuts. We, we, we might be looking for the presence of struts, right? Because many organizations should and can be allergic to, to certain types of frameworks. Um, this talk is not going to be a... Um, a general purpose SBOM talk. There are plenty of those available. I've probably given upwards of 10 of them this year. But this is a really excellent talk by uh, Dr. Alan Friedman from CISA, uh, uh, as well as Frederick from Anthem. Um, this was over at KubeCon this year. And uh, it was a live event. Um, I kind of missed those. But uh, this is a really excellent um, presentation. If you want to get some, some background about what are SBOMs and kind of why they're important and why you should care. However, one of the reasons why we all should care, and although this is US specific, the US federal government has a enormous budget for all kinds of things, including software. And when the US federal government says, hey, software vendors, when I uh, procure software for the federal government, and by the way, you, you have to provide a, a software bill of material, otherwise we won't actually purchase your stuff, that has a downstream impact. The reality is that none of us are, are in the, uh, at the very edge of a, of a software supply chain. The majority of us are in the middle of a software supply chain. We might, we might produce stuff for external use. But guess what? We also consume stuff from, from other vendors, from other providers. We're all kind of in the middle. So with the massive budget that the US has, this, this kind of has a downstream impact on pretty much the entire software industry. Um, the executive order uh, signed earlier this year uh, by President Joseph Biden um, deferred a lot of the requirements over to NIST. And the SBOM specific requirements were deferred even further uh, to NTIA, who the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, who have been working kind of in this space um, formally since around 2018 or so. And they created the minimum elements uh, of an SBOM. And uh, so good publication, uh, fairly light read if, if you want to check it out. But basically, the minimum require the minimum elements of an S bomb are essentially this: supplier name, what is the name of the component, what is the version of the component, um, what are maybe some identifiers, um, and this is more about like CPE or package URL, something that I can 
use to look up that component in, say, the National Vulnerability Database. Um, my dependency relationships, does my component include something else or does it depend on something else? Author and timestamp. These are some basic fields uh, that are required for really basic uh, vulnerability management use cases. So if I have a software bill of material for an application in my environment, I will now know if one of the components in that application has a known vulnerability and I'll have the supplier information so I can contact the supplier for any remediation. Maybe there's a hot fix, maybe there's a patch or an upgrade. Um, so it's, it's really basic vulnerability management use cases. But <laughs> uh, minimum elements um, are kind of a, a, a you know the first dragon but again no no dragons were harmed in the, in the creation of this presentation minimum fields are going to result in minimal benefit um so what else should we actually care about well here's a few of these things that we should care about authenticity integrity verification services etc and we're going to dive in through uh some of these um in, in just a moment here. And let's, let's start with authenticity. If I have an SBOM, if I'm actually produce, if I'm actually, um, if a customer asks for an SBOM and I give them an SBOM, there's no mechanism for sharing these things today. How, how does the consumer of that SBOM know that it hasn't been tampered with? And so there's a way to sign, right? We can we can digitally sign SBOMs today. And um, so authenticity is, is one security and really important security use case that we all should care about. Our global software supply chains are, are under constant attack. And whether it's from inside, um, solar winds, for example, where they, they actually broke into the build system and, and did all kinds of things after gaining access to that. Um, so it's kind of important, uh, not just for the transfer between entities, but even signing within the same organization, because you might actually discover uh, an issue that you didn't realize you had if you are signing things and then verifying those signatures throughout your, your entire process. The integrity verification. If I have a component, has it been modified from its original thing? That's kind of important. Um, again, the solar winds incident. Uh, this was actually part of that uh, part of that issue. Um, so, in, in many cases, however, the a component might have been modified, and it might been might have been intentional. Maybe they backported some security fixes, whatever. But in most cases, if you if you have um, a mismatch in your integrity, in the verification of that integrity, that's interesting. And it, it's it's a data point that as an organization, you should probably care about. Services, um, components, software, doesn't live in a bubble. Um, I can't remember the last time I, I used software that didn't phone home to something, right? That didn't try to automatically update, that didn't rely on some kind of external web service. Services are a very important part of the software inventory and needs to be treated as such. The minimum fields don't account for that. They don't account for services which rules out a very large percentage of software that's created and a very important part of, of, of software that's created. Services are really important and we should care about those in our, in our global inventory of software components. Now, in many cases, um, organizations can and, and will um, make modifications to software. Um, in many cases, these, these cases are typically the result of using a third-party component that 
might no longer be supported, right? Maybe the project is defunct, or maybe that that branch of that of that component is no longer supported. But you have tight coupling in your software. You can't automatically upgrade to the latest version. So what is a responsible organization to do? Well, they backport the security fixes, right? And that is part of your component inventory, right? It's, it's interesting information because it tells the consumer that, yeah, I'm actually using this, this component. Um, yes, I know that it's vulnerable, but you know what? I'm a responsible organization. I've actually mitigated this particular vulnerability by introducing this code block that fixes the issue. So hello, Mr. Customer. Um, you don't have to trust me that I fixed it. Here's the evidence in the SBOM. You can verify it for yourself. So really important use case that really is applicable to many organizations. Now, no software is perfect, right? Every piece of software is going to contain a vulnerability at some point in its life. I'm responsible for, you know, a few CVEs and I know how to do this. Um, you know, writing secure software is hard, right? The stacks that we're all given as developers, they're all inherently broken. RFCs are broken. Everything is, is it's challenging. And a tremendous amount of empathy has to be placed toward development teams uh, because they're expected to perform miracles and get it, get it all right. That's, that's just not reality. Um, but what we need to do is when we're creating our inventory of components, have a reference to a, a, a feed for security advisories so that we can get uh, automatic updates on is this component that I'm using, is it vulnerable or not? even if that vulnerability is not in a public database like the NVD. Vulnerability disclosure. Now, this is not disclosure in this word should probably change, but an SBOM that actually communicates the vulnerabilities that this product actually has. Now, most software vendors are not going to do this, right? They're going to communicate the inventory. However, not all SBOMs are going to come from the vendors, right? They might come from a third party who actually audits a piece of software and vets it for approval for a certain environment, right? So it's very important to be able to identify not only the inventory, but the vulnerabilities that that inventory has at a specific point in time, because that's really important if you need to go back later for forensic or any kind of investigative purposes. Software is really, really complex. And, you know, Stack Overflow is a, 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 a and, and services like that are a, are a popular destination for not only developers, but security people and hackers and everybody else knowing what's in your software right whether you maybe you have a component that you got from a supplier and you don't necessarily know if what else is in their sausage so to speak um, you can specify that saying hey you know i got this component from this supplier but i don't know anything more beyond that um, you can also say that Hey, I've got this component and I know exactly what's in it. Um, and there's all kinds of, of mid, middle ground in, in there as well. Um, but software is complex and even a, a small little code snippet um, can wreak havoc to an otherwise, you know, non vulnerable component, right? Being able to track that vulnerable code and its use across multiple different components. Um, so, being able to identify the completeness or the known unknowns is, is really important security use case. Provenance. Provenance is really about the origin story. Uh, this is where we got something from. Um, if there's anyone in the audience that is has been reading up on um, the Salsa framework, for example, that's uh, OpenSSF, um, their definition of provenance uh, is is very very different than the MITRE 
OWASP and U.S. English versions of, of definitions of the word. Providence is really origin. And in this case, origin could be a few different things. It could be the supplier, like a, a commercial entity where I obtain software from. It could be the, the public repository in which I got something from, Maven Central, NPM, um, you know, PyPI, whatever. It could be, it could be a country. You know, maybe I got something from um, the United States or from Israel or from an adversarial nation state. Right. That's really interesting, interesting information, especially for FOCI use cases, FOCI, uh, F-O-C-I, Foreign uh, Ownership, Control and Influence. Uh, it's a U.S. centric term, but that that um, um, concept, of, uh, all world governments basically have the same concept. Uh, so knowing where you got something from is is really really important uh, even if you verify it and it's and it's and it's it hasn't been tainted just still knowing where you got something from is part of the the cycle of trust pedigree uh, pedigree really refers to the the dna what is my makeup what is my lineage of my components um components you know open source software is is the is the ultimate uh, supply chain, right? Components can and will be forked, modified, renamed, uh, redistributed at Infinitium, right? It, for on and on and on. And being able to identify what your component is and all of your modifications that you've made to it so that you can represent your modified version to the world is a really important use case, especially if those use cases involve you backporting security fixes. Um, fixing defects, adding additional features that maybe that component didn't have to begin with. Well, your modifications are part of that component's pedigree now, and you can describe those with SBOMs today. And, you know, security isn't the only use case. There's other non-security use cases out there, including license compliance. Um, open chain, for example, is is relevant in many many organizations, and S bombs can can be used as a attestation or as a um, compliance artifact for for open chain compliance, for example. And of course, there's many many more use cases that that we as S bomb producers and S bomb consumers should actually care about. Now, when the, um, the NTAA, the National Telecommunications and Inf Information Administration, put out its minimum elements, it spec'd out three different formats. Uh, Cyclone DX, which originated uh, from the OWASP uh, work and is now a flagship OWASP project. Uh, SPDX, which is a Linux Foundation project, um, version 2.2. 2.2.1, I think, is also now an ISO standard. And then SWID, uh, Software ID, um, was also deemed as a uh, um, bill of material format, uh, also an ISO standard. Um, the NVD, just a little bit of background, the NVD has been trying to transition away from common platform enumeration, or CPEs, uh, which is used to identify software and if that software has any vulnerabilities, has been trying to transition away from CPEs, which are deprecated, into using SWID, and uh, we're still kind of waiting. Um, so hopefully that will happen soon. So that's one of the reasons why SWID is kind of included with this. However, the um, not all SBOM formats are created equal. In fact, once you actually get past the minimum elements, um, format really, really matters. And in fact, the minimum elements are written in a way where technically SWID is not capable of achieving the minimum requirements. Um, I'm not going to get into the, the reasons why that happened, but I can say that NIST and NTIA, our sister agencies, uh, both uh, rolling up to the Department of Commerce. Um, so 
the only two formats that organizations should be concerned about is Cyclone DX and SPDX. Now, Cyclone DX is specifically designed to be a bill of material format. But what is SPDX? Um, SP, Software Package uh, Data Exchange, I think it's uh, called. And here comes Hazy Dragon. I want to introduce you to Hazy Dragon because Hazy Dragon is a little confused right, right about now. Um, it's confused because it, it, it doesn't know a lot of identity right about now because it, it read through this little paragraph on the SPDX specification where it describes asset identifiers and other content believed to be relevant to a package. And that sentence is very, very important because one, uh, the, the package doesn't have an, identi a, 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 an identity that actually maps out to uh, a database like the National Vulnerability Database or OSS Index or any of the others, uh, VulnDB for risk-based security. Rather, it uses external references um, with a belief system. And this is really, really important uh, because the specification um, is flexible. It allows you to have multiple Maven coordinates, multiple NPM coordinates, uh, multiple package URLs, and multiple CPEs for the exact same package. Obviously, this is not possible in the real world, and certainly you wouldn't want this for a bill of material specification. But a belief is not a fact. And facts matter in a software bill of material. And to provide a little bit of context, and not just for this particular case of, of just the fact-based approach. Let's, let's take a container as an example, but not this kind of container. We, we want to talk about this kind of container. And inside this container, maybe there's 100 of these. And inside each one of these pallets, I have a 1,000 different widgets. And each one of those widgets has one of these. And this tells me exactly what that product is. There's no belief, there's no evidence, it's just a fact. This component is that. The problem with a lot of possibilities is that possibilities are not actionable, right? Possibilities might be good for strategic initiatives across an organization. However, when you want to do impact analysis and vulnerability response, if I have tens of thousands of assets in my environment and I need to very quickly identify which ones are going to be impacted by a potentially vulnerable component, possibilities are not what I want. I want very specific things that my teams are going to have to respond to and I will prioritize them based on the business risk. Um, if I have to go through a bunch of possibilities, that's going to increase my response time um, to the point where is SBOM really going to be beneficial? I don't know. So that doesn't make Hazy Dragon all that happy. His head explodes. But SPDX, and this is this is not a bash on, on SPDX. Uh, SPDX is, is actually a really good format for what it was designed to do. But I grabbed, out of curiosity, I grabbed the words BOM, SBOM, inventory, and materials, and I came across a single occurrence of the word materials, um, but it was in relation to a data license paragraph. Um, so I, I still have a question. Uh, maybe you can help me answer it or not. I think instead of looking at the two formats as one or the other in terms of competition, I think we have to start framing it as using the best tool for the job. Now, the hammer was invented three million years ago when cavemen decided to attach a stick to a rock. Um, and it wasn't until the 15th century that the screwdriver was invented. Now, did the screwdriver replace the hammer? No. 
it's a different tool for a different job. And as SBOM creators, as SBOM uh, consumers, we need to choose the best tool for the job that we are doing. And when we are creating SBOMs, there are some hidden dragons in there. So let's, let's find out what some of those are. Now, there's a lot of different ways that we can produce SBOMs. Um, there's, there's, there's probably more ways to produce SBOMs than there are to uh, consume and, and, and analyze them for sure. Um, my favorite way is, is build time integration, right? I like integrating uh, SBOM creation in the build lifecycle itself. If I can tie onto a, a package management system like Maven or NPM or, you know, uh, any of the other composer or, you know, Cocoa Pods or whatever the case is, if I can tie into one of those, that those package managers, um, even the kind of the quirky ones like Go, they, they provide a lot of rich metadata about the components that I'm pulling in to my software. And I can reuse, I can, I can, I can use that information in the creation of an SBOM. And this is, this is a lot of data that you don't get after the fact, right? It's, it's very hard to obtain a lot of this data afterwards, right? So integrating into the build has a lot of different advantages. However, there's some, you know, most build systems have a build life cycle. Um, there's very few that actually just have like a, a lock file and it's just written in stone, right? They all typically have some kind of variance and the life cycle actually matters. Uh, for example, if you take Maven, who has a very predetermined um, formal life cycle, its dependency graph isn't fully resolved until certain stages of that life cycle. So if you were to analyze a Palm, for example, outside of the outside of the build itself, your inventory and your dependency graph would be inaccurate because it didn't go through that life cycle. Likewise, if I'm creating an, uh, a, a JavaScript front end and the most common method of distribution of front ends is typically Webpack or one of the similar types of, uh, of packing technologies. Well, Node, you know, NPM, um, is based on a, a micro module architecture, right? There's modules for everything, but your resulting JavaScript front end is going to have a fraction of the modules that are actually in your lock file, right? Not everything in your lock file actually ends up in your, in your, in your distributable. Um, and if you want to communicate out to a customer, what's actually in your software versus what's just in your lock file. Those are entirely different things. And you're only going to get that information if you actually integrate with the Webpack process itself. You can't do it after the fact, right? It can't be done. Um, now, there are some standalone tools um, that try to do this. OWASP went down this path in 2012, 2013, and it didn't really work all that well. And the idea was to try to just add, it, this was not the dependency check project, which was, which was very, very good, by the way. Jeremy Long has done a fantastic job with that project. If you haven't checked it out, you should. Um, but we try to create um, a, a way to, to do a elementary bill of material as a universal tool, and it just didn't work for the reasons that, that were mentioned, right? Build integration, build life cycle really, really matters. The other way you can produce SBOMs is from source files. Now, this is, um, I, I think its uh, importance is, is minimal, um, but you can create an SBOM uh, from all of your source files. And it's basically, I mean, I think you can do it better if you just link to the version control uh, system and specify the commit or the tag, right? Just specify the, the commit or the commit hash. Um, Cause that's going to, that's immutable. That's going to tell you everything you need to know. And you don't actually have to create the, the source S bomb. So save yourself some trouble, but it can be done. Now you can also create S bombs with SCA tools and other types of forensic or audit tools, right? 
Uh, there's many binary and manifest um, um, SCA tools out there that can create SBOMs. The interesting thing, and here comes another dragon, the interesting thing about SCA is that they're not designed to identify an accurate inventory. That's not their job. Their job is to identify risk. And most of the time, being close enough is good enough, right? If I'm a minor version off on something, is it still vulnerable? Probably. Is it is it license? Is it to still have the same license? Probably. Um, it's usually not a big deal. But S bombs accuracy actually matters. Um, so that's that's one caveat. But um, you can produce them, and it's really really easy for you to do this today without having to integrate them all with with all of your builds. If you already have SCA tools in your pipeline. Um, especially some of the commercial tools, those commercial tools, many of them can produce uh, Cyclone DX S-bombs today. The ones that can't, you should ask the vendors to support it. Um, finally, this is, this is one I'm really, really proud of. Um, uh, I never thought it would happen, and I, especially, it, I never thought it would happen so easily. Um, but IASP and RASP, as well as mobile, everything runtime, you can actually create S-bombs at runtime while the application's actually running. And that's really interesting. I mean, you're not going to get the build time metadata, that rich data that you have, but you get some really interesting other data, right? You're going to get the components that are actually invoked, right? Um, you, can, you can create the, the full bomb if you want. And you can also specify, hey, this one over here, yeah, it, it's not really used. So yeah, if, if you have vulnerabilities in it, it's probably of a, of a, of a less priority for you. Um, but that's a really interesting um, idea is be able, be able to see which ones are invoked and, and which ones are not. The other thing that's, that's really interesting to me is being able to dynamically um, um, recognize the services that these components are calling out to, right? And those services can be part of the inventory and then part of the dependency graph. For example, if I have a, uh, a, a Java component that is uh, responsible for getting stock quotes, right? Um, it's a convenience library. It's a shim, essentially. Uh, it allows me to programmatically get a stock quote without actually having to worry about uh, the REST calls or the HTTP or the TLS negotiation, right? Everything is kind of handled for me by that library. I just have to call, hey, get quotes for um, MSFT, right? And instead, you know, that component then actually relies on a service, actually handles all the communication, gets the result, returns that result, so that I can use it. Maybe it returns a string, right? Um, that service, that component, and that dependency on that service can actually be represented in an SBOM. That's fantastic, right? That's that's something that I, I really was hoping that we would get to, and we got to it a lot sooner than we thought we would. Um, there's a lot of innovation happening in this space today, but there's many other ways that we can that we can also produce SBOMs today. But I wanted to mention all of this to you because when you start out the path of creating S-bombs, it's really easy to kind of go down a, a path and, and not necessarily know that you're kind of on the wrong path and, and shoot yourself in the foot. So watch out for the dragons and try to use a kind of a mix and match of, of kind of all the different ways to produce S-bombs. Because if you take some build S-bombs, and some SCAS bombs. I, I like to use the phrase uh, trust but verify, right? I like to produce S bombs in my build pipeline and use commercial SCA tools as verification, right? Um, and then the runtime, if you merge all that data in there, you're going to have the most feature rich S bomb of, of anyone. Um, so, and then of course, watch out for the pitfalls as well. Because if you go down the wrong path, if you um, you know do a source S bomb and and think that that's going to help you for I don't know vulnerability management use cases, it's not. It, it's not. It, it's 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 going to help you for a few 
uh, but there's there's much bigger things that we need to worry about. So the the richer your S bomb is, the better data going into it, the better you're gonna better results you're gonna have coming out of it. And I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about Cyclone DX. Um, yes, there's there's a couple different S bomb formats. This particular one is coming out of OWASP, and I think it's really important in the security space. So we're going to dive into it in, uh, for just a little bit. Now, Cyclone DX is, um, it, there's a huge focus on simplicity, right? I, I, we could have created the perfect model, but perfection wasn't our goal, right? We wanted to create something that was lightweight, that would be validatable with XML schema or JSON schema. Right, we didn't want to use some weird tools to be able to validate our S bombs. Um, so really focus on simplicity. But the model itself is also very, very simple. Um, essentially, your your inventory is either a component or a service, and this is by design, right? Because a simple data model allows us to create very simple tools. And very simple tools allow me to orchestrate the creation of an SBOM throughout my entire build pipeline. So instead of thinking about SBOM creation as just a point in time event, hey, I got a piece of software, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create an SBOM, boom, done. Um, that might work for a lot of software, but there's also a lot of software in there where that concept just doesn't work, right? You, you, uh, you typically want to enhance or correct or modify that SBOM throughout the course of a build pipeline. And once you get to the end, then you can sign and verify that SBOM. And at that point, you actually have something that you can deliver, whether it's internal delivery or external delivery to a customer. But think of SBOM creation as a process. And if you have a very simple tool all right, very simple model. You can have very simple tools and highly efficient tools that can scale to producing tens of thousands of S bombs per day in a build pipeline without a lot of effort. Right. Um, so it's highly designed for for automation purposes. the The simple model, however, uh, has some really interesting benefits. It's uh, uh, it's very easy to adopt as well as um, create new implementations of Cyclone DX. Um, the adoption is, is really about, you know, as organizations, let's just create an SBOM. But there's a lot of tools that needed to be created, right? Yeah, I have a specification. But having a special specification that nobody supports isn't beneficial, right? You need a specification that people want to support. And whoops, and, uh, and it's really elementary for whether it's an individual contributor or a commercial vendor to read, understand, and create a fully compliant, 100% compliant implementation of Cyclone DX in under a day. It's, it's not hard. Um, now, I mentioned everything was either a component or a service. And there's a lot of different types of components, uh, everything from applications and libraries and frameworks, uh, containers, operating systems, Firmware devices, yes, uh, we support hardware a bit. Not very good today, but um, that will be improving. Um, files and, of course, services. Um, the interesting thing about the Cyclone DX model is that it's really a bomb format. It's Yes, it's a software bill of material format, but it's also an operations bill of material format. And, and OBOMs are actually a BSIM requirement. If, if your organization is into maturity models, uh, operations bill of material are a requirement for SBOMs, uh, which often vary a little bit from software bill of materials. I might have an application, but you know what? That application is deployed somewhere. Maybe it's deployed to an app server that's then you know running on an operating system. Well, that would be my operations bill of material, that, that full stack inventory right? Manufacturing bill of materials. This is really for hardware use cases. And uh, we're making some improvements in that space. It's it's not prime time yet, but it, it, it will be. And software as a service 
bill of materials. This is something that Cyclone DX has supported for a very long time now, being able to describe our services. And in fact, we can describe complete um, uh, microservice architectures. We can describe services that depend on other servers or, or which include other services. So we can describe a, a system of systems uh, approach, whether it's microservices, the actor model, or, or any kind of architectural construct. Uh, that's, that's all supported today. The great thing about Cyclone DX is that this is not theory, right? This is not something that's, that's new. Um, this is in production at a staggering number of organizations today. An estimated 100,000 organizations are using Cyclone DX in production today. Now, the 100,000 number is interesting because it's, it's a big enough number that you can step back and say, hey, you know what? This thing actually has merit, right? This thing is actually being used by a lot of organizations. And if there were problems with the SPAC, you would, you would have heard about it, right? Bad news travels uh, much, much, much easier than, uh, and further than, uh, than good news. So if the spec had problems or, you know, whatever, uh, we would hear about it and we haven't, which is, which is a great thing. Um, but the other interesting thing about this number is that it represents a small fraction of the number of organizations in existence, right? There's millions and millions of organizations. Yes. hundred thousand is a great number, right? No, no doubt about that, but it's a small fraction in compared to where we want it to be, right? So we have a lot of growth potential. So uh, from this, this is kind of your call to action. Now, the Cyclone DX website um, has a lot of different use cases that's, that's outlined here. We talked about a lot of these use, these use cases from uh, vulnerability management and, and pro provenance and pedigree and all these, these other cases. There are examples in both uh, XML and JSON on the Cyclone DX website. Now, the default uh, view when you go to the website is XML. And I don't want you to think that uh, the, the specs started out being XML. Our preference is actually JSON. However, JSON, you can't make comments in it. Um, XML, you can. So when you're showing examples for something it's it's actually easier to show it in xml because you can have inline comments a multi-line inline comments um and then you can just switch over to the to the json example and then and then see it and then see the json representation of that so check out this page um because it's going to give you some concrete examples that um that are real right that you can use today with tools like OWASP dependency track and some of the commercial and competing tools that support the consumption and analysis of SBOMs today. The other resource that I want to tell you about is the Cyclone DX Tool Center. And the Tool Center is, um, is basically a resource to um, have all the commercial as well as the open source uh, tools that are available in the market. Um, if now these are just the ones that we know of, and I think there's around 85 of them today that we know of. Actually, I just found out about another one uh, a couple hours ago, so I've got to add it today. So by the end of the day, there'll be 86. Um, these are just the ones that we know about, though. So if you come across any others, uh, let us know. Actually, in the in on that page, there's a link at the bottom of the page. Uh, to the repo so you can submit a pull request. So if you know of a tool, you can either let us know um, uh, or you can just submit a, a pull request. But it's also a way for, uh, if you're a commercial vendor and you want to get some um, acknowledgement, for example, that uh, that you support the standard, uh, it's a way to get kind of included in the, uh, in the global list of, of all known tools. So if you know of anything or if you have a product in the pipeline that that is going to be supporting Cyclone DX, uh, I highly encourage you to just reach out or submit a pull request and, and let us know. We, we want to provide the community with, um, with all the tools necessary so that if they're looking for X, they can actually find it, right? So that's, that's really the purpose of, uh, of, of the tool center is a, uh, a springboard to kind of get you started. 
Now, the current version of Cyclone DX is version 1.3. And uh, it, it, it's a fantastic spec, um, you know, lots of contributions, both from individual contributors, as well as a lot, lot of um, uh, commercial contributions that we've had to the spec. Version 1.4 is currently in development, and um, we're anticipating a release of I don't know, about the January 2022 timeframe, so not, not too far out. Um, we are going to be improving um, our hardware support for manufacturing bill of material use cases, right? This, is, um, this has come up many, many times, uh, especially in the industrial control system space, as well as the, um, the IoT space. Um, the interesting thing about hardware is that they have a long history. Of, of using and creating and producing um, uh, bombs, right? This is not new to hardware space. They've been doing this for decades and they have their ways of doing things. Um, so it's, it's very advantageous um, to not necessarily mix and match, right? You typically don't want a bomb that has both hardware and software components. You typically want to separate them um, just well, there's a lot of reasons why you would want to separate them, but um, in, in, we will be improving our hardware support in 1.4. Now, as I mentioned, Cyclone DX is a bill of materials format, and we can kind of represent almost anything as, as inventory, including vulnerabilities. So bill of vulnerabilities is going to be a thing. So if you want to communicate um, a, just a list of vulnerabilities from one machine to another, um, you'll actually have that capability. And this is a very common use case, especially across different sources of vulnerability intelligence. Um, we're going to be improving our, our VEX support. Now, what is VEX? VEX is vulnerability and exploitability. Think of it as a, the inverse of an advisory. Right, an advisory tells you everything that's wrong. A vex tells you everything that's not wrong. Right, um, I might have a, I might be using a, a vulnerable version of OpenSSL, but the way that I'm using it, or the way that it was compiled, I'm not. My application is not vulnerable. Vex is a way to communicate that out because, as an organization that consumes S bombs. I want to make risk-based decisions. I want to I want to patch the things that actually matter. Now, if an application is using a, a vulnerable version of OpenSSL, but it's not actually called or invoked, right? That vulnerable function isn't invoked. That's going to take a lot lower priority in terms of my patch schedule than maybe some of my other things that are in my pipeline. So, Vex is a way to help organizations prioritize the things that they should care about. Um, we've supported this use case since about 2019. In fact, Sonotype, who's been a really big supporter of Cyclone DX, actually contributed to this extension. Um, by definition, XML is extensible. JSON is not. Um, and we've learned a lot about the, the VEX support that we currently have with Cyclone DX 1.3 and lower. And we've made a bunch of improvements. We've we, we've rallied uh, a bunch of folks from um, different cloud providers, different security vendors, et cetera. We've got a huge amount of contributions just for this one use case, because it's a really important one and we want to get it right. And that's, that's on target for 1.4. 1.4 also doubles as an advisory format. Uh, which will be interesting because CSAF is also now a thing. CSAF version two, which is the common security advisory framework or format, framework or format, I can't remember, uh, but Sorry. check it out. That's um, two minutes. Sorry. Okay. No, no worries. We're going to be standardizing the release notes, which is something that, that most software doesn't do today. Uh, there's no mechanism to standardize our release notes. Uh, release notes are Markdown or HTML or PDF or Word documents. There's no way to, to really use that in a machine readable way. Cyclone DX is going to change that. So that's going to be really, really interesting. And of course, we're a security uh, standard. So we're going to be hardening, uh, hardening the standard above and beyond what it's, what it's already at, as well as improving the documentation now that it's, uh, 
not a, not just for a, a security niche. This is this is a, a very mainstream effort now. So here's the links to to participate in the community. Uh, check out our website. Everything's on GitHub. We have a dedicated Slack instance, uh, independent of OWASP for historical reasons, but we also have 20 plus channels as well. Um, so check out that uh, LinkedIn and Twitter for social. And thank you so much for listening to me babble for the last 50 minutes. And I promise no, no dragons were hurt in the, in the creation of this, of this presentation. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much.